So now it's time for our afternoon keynote. And uh, I'm excited to introduce these two gentlemen to share the work that they're doing at Zurich Instruments. Uh, Stephen Koch is, as he describes himself, Qubit Agnostic VP of Sales. And he has a track record of pro providing value to customers and in the last five years to dozens of quantum researchers worldwide. He's also referred to as the defender of price. His colleague Tobias Thiel is a quantum enthusiast with a track record working in hybrid and quantum systems combining solid state and atomic physics, magnetometry, and atomic quantum computers at places like ETH, uh, Oxford, Caltech, and GILA. So Tobias is now the application scientist and technology promoter at Zurich Instruments. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, Christopher. Hello, Inside Quantum Technology. It's a big honor for us, Tobias and myself, to hold the keynote for this afternoon uh, about qubit technologies and subsystems. We intend to provide an overview uh, of the interface between basic research and applications, which in this context are the playgrounds where qubit technologies are becoming useful and the subsystems are evolving together with research requirements. We're going to have a very diverse afternoon uh, looking at aspects of various qubit platforms, superconducting, photons, vacancy centers, and so subsystems such as cooling, repeaters and memories, uh, quantum computing, and sensing. These technologies all have an application they excel at and it's gonna be great to explore them and touching base. What do they have in common and where do they differ apart that they're all for quantum technologies? We will be looking at technologies that are at the edge of success, therefore at different stages of commercial maturity and some of them are not here to stay. It also turns out that the nature of the challenges are diverse, so are as well their market opportunities. In this quantum race, we see an exponential scaling of performance. And therefore, we'd like to put the time versus performance on a 2D map, you see as well on this slide, while putting the, on the horizontal axis the time and the vertical axis the, the performance indicator. And uh, this can be different for each technology. For instance, for uh, superconducting qubits, it would be the amount of qubits that the uh, system provides or, for instance, the quantum volume. In this landscape, we see essentially two trusts. A technology one, where performance of a subsystem is refined, such as sensitivity, coherence time of, or efficiency. And a scaling one, where performance indicator evolve, like uh, the number of qubits, the interconnects in a cryostat, or the bandwidth in a communication network. All these have an exponential uh, demand of resource, a growing demand. And uh, we see as well as capabilities that have been developed for the technology trust move up towards the scaling trust when they get mat mature enough. So looking at two topics of this afternoon, the ND sensing uh, uh, centers where uh, they are to get clearly moving along the technology dimension to uh, today don't have any push towards more sensing elements. Repeaters for uh, communication instead, uh, these leads, they will lead to a scaling of distance, connectivity and bandwidth, and potentially even for hybrid quantum networks composed of local fiber and long distance satellite links. For quantum computing and qubit control, the case is clear. More qubits need to be connected to form a working processor. This requires many new technologies like larger cryostats, new cooling techniques, but maybe also interconnected cryostats. We see challenges with exploding complexity of the pool sequences and the number of elements on a chip that need to be controlled. So what is Zurich Instruments' mission? in this field. With our background of signal processing and measurement system and the experience 
uh, working with research uh, since the company was founded 12 years ago, and dozens of applications in the quantum field, such as lock-in amplifiers for sensors, and as we heard this morning, for optically pumped magnetometers. Our arbitrary waveforms are, are shaping photons and uh, generate excitations in repeaters, and our quantum analyzers run ever more complex pulse sequences. Our finding is the following. No one fits all approach is possible. And uh, quantum research needs more than just one set of electronics. And on top of that, a very skilled customer facing team. So we continue with a, new, a few aspects of quantum computing. And a typical quantum stack is pro pro proposed here with the programming layer on the top where the applications live and the uh, middleware where algorithms are adapted to the executing hardware. It's a layer where uh, oh, Adrian Roll yesterday mentioned it's mostly underestimated. Bottom and at the bottom we have the hardware where the pulses are generated and signals are measured. And you can break up this uh, second, this last box further by this classical division between a control unit at room temperature and the uh, quantum processing unit at cryogenic temperatures. One issue of the industry is that the development still happens on blockwise. Companies focus on what they do best. However, researchers working on test beds like Lawrence Berkeley National Lab need to control it all. And other system integrators like IQM from Finland offer the inquire, have to offer the entire quantum computer, cover the entire stack too. Therefore, I'd like to quote a paper from a colleague of ours that appeared on Nature that uh, to design a component right, one needs to have a look at the full stack. In this article, it's discussed that co-design between layers is required. Limitations on one level cannot be compensated by optimizing or compensating for it on the level above. If you look at the cabling between the processing units here on the slide, this has a risk of uh, exploding with a computer at 150 qubits, maybe a thousand lines will be required. Today in experiments, maybe this cabling is not yet limiting for most of the experiments, but the scaling trust will require leaps. So an idea would be intercon optical interconnects, but this is also a very early state technology too. To sum up, the overall benchmarks will be required for uh, using defined algorithms to measure the performance of these quantum stack boxes. The industry still needs to converge on those. And that was mentioned in the software panel yesterday. At ZI, we are definitely aiming to provide the verification of the boxes without needing to know the customer to need all the details inside. And for this mission, our understanding of progress is to release researchers from having to program low-level code inside of control electronics, which may be controversial, as we can see from the approach of some of the players in the field. So, handing over to Tobias, what are the consequences in a cryostat looking at these two trusts? Okay, so um, thanks, Stefan, and uh, let's maybe jump right into that question. And to answer this question, we first acknowledge that we need on the order, in, that it's uh, suggested that we need on the order of a million qubits to have a powerful and yet useful and fault-tolerant quantum computer in the future. And for superconducting qubits, this would require a chip which is on the order of two square meters, or uh, roughly uh, said, a pretty large cryostat. Okay, and current state of the art uh, in these diameters is on the order of maybe half a meter, so that's uh, still an order of magnitude away. And although the institutions such as Fermilab are planning to build much larger systems, the sheer size of such a cooling system is actually not the only challenge. Actually, cooling power and uh, uh, what mentioned was, was mentioned before, the cabling and the interconnect real estate 
or differently said, essentially the, the proper isolation and amplification of the processor are uh, critical to be able to scale up in these uh, cooling systems. And we're looking now into different packaging of microwave cables, such as uh, here by Blue Force or alternatives, for example, flex cables as from, from Delft circuits, uh, and how well they scale. This is something which is clearly along the scaling thrust. There are still technologies which are uh, clearly also in the technology thrust domain. For example, uh, mentioned also before these photonic links or non-reciprocal amplifiers or microwave networks and, and fridge uh, interconnects, uh, such as the ones which are developed in the SuperQLAN project. But there's also other challenges which are part of active innovation and development. And uh, for example, today's solution refrigerators have their challenges. For example, helium-3 is getting more and more scarce, and at least nowadays getting it from the moon is uh, still pretty expensive. Um, so in addition to that, there's also this, uh, so this plumbing approach uh, in addition to that is, is really something which is expensive and time consuming if leaks appear. And uh, this is why there's a certain need also for new technologies and cooling alternatives. An example here is the adiabatic demagnetization, which is a technique used uh, also or promoted by Qtra, uh, for example. And then there's also other challenges uh, which are here to really support processor technology and innovation uh, in this technology thrust by allowing to, for example, get more and more statistics on their samples. And here, of course, cries that cool down times are really a critical factor. So now, on the other hand, the control side of quantum computing is sort of a classical example on how technology thrust can really feed uh, into the scaling thrust. And since this is sort of our expertise, maybe let's exemplify this now a bit more. So over the past few years, we've seen an exponential growth in the desired number of qubits, uh, which need to be controlled by a quantum computer. And what you see here in this chart is an example of, uh, uh, of our collaborators or the qubit numbers that our collaborators have committed to. And sustaining such an exponential growth, essentially of anything which consumes resources uh, like qubit numbers is already, of course, a challenge in itself uh, and often requires careful thought to achieve scalability. However, besides qubit numbers, there's sort of a second dimension which also scales too in quantum computing, and this is the complexity of the algorithms and the sequences. And this is even true for a single qubit. So for example, if you look at the sequence 10 years ago, uh, it had sort of two standard pulses, for example, a simple Rabi uh, or Ramsey sequence here. Um, and if you compare this now with uh, typical sequence today, where you have hundreds or even thousands of pulses, which need to be tuned up individually, you can see there's a lot of progress or a lot of change has happened since then. And to enable this from the control side is clearly a task for a control system which serves the technology thrust, as it provides the system to increase the control performance of a subsystem of a larger and, in the end, scalable quantum computer. So let's take with maybe this challenge for a time and have a look at a few case or success stories from the last year where people really pushed forward this technology thrust using control systems and quantum computing, which were really designed uh, to, to really support these, these thrusts. For example, uh, now we first focus on single qubit gates. Um, uh, question, you can ask yourself the question, okay, what is one of the key challenges of qubit control? And this is, uh, for example, to, to make the gates as short as possible, because of course the shorter the gate is, the more you can press into a specific coherence time, um, but they still, of course, need to be of very high fidelity. And in this example here, IBM made this record short single qubit gates of four nanoseconds and with a great fidelity of above 99.7%. So how did they do this? Well, they first needed an AWG and uh, in fact, uh, our AWG, but uh, that, uh, which in the end had the right specs, okay? So it was neither over nor under engineered. In this case, really the 16-bit vertical resolution and the 400 picosecond time resolution were critical because only this combination allowed them to discretize these short pulses in this piecewise constant function, which you see here, and then run an optimization algorithm on these pulse heights. So essentially what they did is that in each optimization step, they varied these heights and then checked whether the new pulse shape now performed better or worse than before. And just to be clear why this is really challenging, uh, from a control side is, uh, if you now consider you have this pulse with that runs at 99.7% fidelity, actually to quantify that number, you need to run thousands of similar pulses, uh, typically nowadays in, in randomized benchmarking sequences, and then measure the drop in fidelity. And this is actually something which was not possible a few years ago. 
And why is this the case? Well, uh, harshly said, uh, because AWGs were stupid, okay? And agreed that this is indeed a, a harsh uh, phrasing, but essentially what it means is that you needed to upload large CSV files which contained all your pulses pre-calculated and then different files were played with respect to certain trigger events or maybe at best sort of simple jump commands. And this is of course something which is extremely slow and inefficient and makes feedback or error correction almost impossible. Nowadays, AWGs are, are smarter and an essentially important concept which introduced also with our instruments is that really unlocks and which really unlocks playing long sequences efficiently is the so-called pulse level sequencing concept. And this relies essentially on the concept of a pulse, uh, which then gets assembled by a sophisticated AWG. So why is this crucial, not only for the technology thrust, but also for the scaling thrust? Well, on the one hand, it adopts, of course, simple concepts from the higher levels of the stack. Um, and then it, what it mainly does, it really minimizes the information which needs to be transferred to the instrumentation or the control system. And this is an extremely important point because you only really want to communicate what is absolutely necessary to the instrument. And uh, this will be one, if not maybe the key limitation when you want to run a computer or a quantum computer efficiently in the future, especially if you want to combine it with uh, high fidelity algorithms. And uh, since the, since the, um, the, 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 the uh, performance of the individual qubits uh, increases. So now the question is uh, whether this extends now easily to two qubit gates using DC or, or flux pulses. And the answer is, of course, uh, unfortunately, no. Okay. And why is this the case? Well, one of the cases here is that pulses around DC, they just tore on their path from the AWG to the qubit. And this in the end limits the gate fidelity, as you can see here, for example, by this paper from Neo Di Carlo in Delft where they uh, transferred an excitation from one qubit to another with such a flux pulse. And then you, if you see in the left plot, uh, the fidelity was there limited to roughly 70 to 80%, uh, as you can also see by the contrast of the oscillations on this left plot. And the reason for this is that the pulse had sort of long transients and the optimal pulse shape at a specific point in your sequence really depended on the pulse history. For example, if another pulse was played before or not. So in this case, uh, pulses could not be reused and essentially pulse level sequencing was not possible. However, in the end, Leo achieved just that, resulting in this very nice symmetric two qubit gates, which work at a, uh, at a fidelity of uh, above 99.9% and also at the speed limit of 14 milliseconds. So what was the main ingredient here? Uh, and again, this was a, a feature of a, uh, of a control system and it was in fact a real-time pre-compensation. So real-time pre-compensation is essentially a set of filters which pre-distort the pulses and then compensate the distortions from the cryostat. It's uh, sort of, of course, still a hard problem uh, to characterize the distortions of your cryostat in the first hand, but as soon as you know it, you can essentially just program these filters and the result is that uh, you get what you program. This means you can always be sure that the pulses which you program in your sequence or your AWG arrive at the qubit faithfully, independent of the pulse history. So in that respect, you can actually reuse pulses and make full use of the pulse level sequencing also for two qubit gates. So this pulse level sequencing is just one example of a key technology which needs to transfer in the end from the technology to the scaling thrust. But there's also other technologies which should only live in the scaling thrust. And here, for example, three examples uh, that you should keep in mind which you want to scale up. So typically you need first a, a scalable system architecture or control system architecture where the number of control instruments or qubits will not impede the performance uh, such as feedback latency or synchronization. And then you need to optimize away whatever you can. So even small jobs like an IQ mixer calibration, you do only, you do maybe once a day for a single qubit, uh, will be significant if you have now thousands of lines because then in the end, you're only constantly recalibrating your system, also because for some of these task parallelization only gets you so far. Last, there can be, of course, errors which happen only rarely with a single qubit, and thermal excitation is an example of that. And the, but the more qubits you have, then in the end, the more likely a qubit will be non-functional during a sequence because of such an error. And many of these problems in the end ask for solutions in which a key figure of merit get in the, gets independent of the qubit numbers, and hence will scale indefinitely. So let's see how we approach some of these uh, examples. <laughs> 
And we start here with the right system architecture. And in principle, there's two alternatives, okay? There's, you have the star topology where you have a central processing unit and all instruments are controlled in parallel. And then you have this daisy chain uh, architecture where all instruments are connected in series. And of course, although daisy chaining your instruments is often the easier approach to, to design and has a certain advantages, we went in the end with the star topology because of its critical advantages for quantum computing. For example, uh, in this case, the feedback latency really does not change no matter how many qubits or instruments you connect to your system. And this is, of course, a clear advantage. And indeed, we can guarantee now sub-nanosecond synchronization between any channel of our control instruments. And also, in principle, we can just add more and more instruments without any change of the system performance. Also, what's nice to show here is that our, uh, is, is our uh, recently launched second generation instruments. Um, so these are the ones which you see at the bottom and in the left uh, with the many SMA connectors. And these are really designed to fully support now the scaling thrust, uh, but maintain a sort of still the high performance throughout as they're benefiting from key technologies from the, uh, from the technology thrust. So these instruments, they really tackle a big problem when you scale up your qubit numbers. Uh, and this is cabling and the amounts of instruments that need to work together synchronously uh, and also uh, the calibration uh, needs uh, is removed in this case. So what do these instruments do what others don't? So essentially each instrument, instrument integrates in the end several full room temperature readout or control setups. So let's take the readout as an example. Uh, and what you see here in this scheme uh, represented by the light blue part is what a typical room temperature readout uh, setup needs to do. And I will not go into the details here, but essentially mention that this typically requires between four to 10 instruments, which need to be characterized, uh, calibrated, and need to work together flawlessly. So now a single instrument of our, uh, a single channel of our instruments actually replaces all that. And uh, this means that for setting up the instrument, you only need essentially two microwave cables, which connect the instrument to the cryostat. And hence this really strongly reduces any setup and tune up time in your system. But there's also another advantage. And this is really integrating everything into one box allows you to design the instrument or parts of the instrument once and very good. And uh, it, allows, it allowed us in this specific case to get rid of one thing which really bugs many superconducting qubit researchers. And it is, that is this uh, previously mentioned mixer calibration. And it's also a great example on how to get rid of routines and even small tasks which can explode when you scale up your system. So let me exemplify this very quickly. Uh, so what you see here is the difference between an IQ mixer spectrum uh, in yellow and the spectrum of our instruments using a double superheterodyne approach. And what we did here is we, we applied pulses, uh, the actual pulses that we wanted were between 5.1 and 5.6 gigahertz. Uh, and now with, you can identify sort of two problems with the mixer measurements, okay? And the, uh, the first one is that you see that there's of course many unwanted tones uh, at and below five gigahertz uh, that you don't want, okay? And they cannot be calibrated away. Uh, second, and even these, uh, these, even these additional tones, they are not stable and will change with small temperature changes in the lab. So both of these issues will in the end really affect your gate fidelity and can only be mitigated somewhat by recurring mixer calibration. So it's clear in the end that no matter what people will tell, an IQ mixer biased uh, approach will not scale to hundreds or thousands of qubits and high performance computations at the same time especially as qubit uh, technology improves. So with our approach in blue, we now get a much better performance. And uh, in the end, we also do not need to calibrate our mixers at all. So we eliminate essentially this tune up and calibration time of the up conversion setup completely and save a lot of time and error potential. So what else do we gain by maximal integration into a single instrument? Of course, we can reduce the cost per qubit, that's clear. But on the other hand, we can actually integrate additional features which help get rid of errors or get getting rid of errors or getting errors under control, which are only relevant for many qubits. Remember, for example, this was the last point to keep in mind when scaling up. And an example here are problems which arise from qubits which are excited to an F level due to thermal excitation. And this is an effect which is really only relevant if you have a lot of qubits in your system. Uh, Multi-state discrimination, as you can see here uh, in this measurement, which was done together with Andreas Waller of the ETH, really allows you in the end to mitigate this problem. And isn't this measurement now a nice point to end this discussion about quantum computing uh, and control systems and quickly mention examples of technology and scaling thrust challenges 
uh, in other topics like uh, quantum networks. So to date, uh, there exist several quantum networks which use different technologies and new QKD protocols are constantly developed uh, and employed. And there's different type of sources, receivers and photon wavelengths, for example, rare third ion crystals, which interface nicely with existing telecom wavelengths uh, infrastructure. Or there's the technologies based on single emitters such as nitrogen or silicon vacancy centers. And one big challenge here is the efficient transfer over larger distances through lossy channels uh, be it using fibers or space-borne satellites. And repeaters, they can ensure that, but only mostly classical or trusted ones are nowadays uh, uh, deployed in, in larger uh, networks. And the quantum repeaters, which really would provide an end-to-end -end encryption, they're still heavily in the research phase and can be attributed to the technology thrust. So different approaches here are promising, for example, you have the standard repeaters, which are based on heralded entanglement with long-lived quantum memories or alternatives such as one-way repeaters, which uh, include or, or such, use uh, logical qubits or, or error correction protocols. However, even if you have in the end a working network, loss will always be there to a certain degree and countermeasures may include something like entanglement distillation. Um, but the challenge here, for example, is, and this is of course clearly a challenge of the scaling thrust, is that this number of schemes to do this uh, grows super exponentially with the number of nodes. And of course, here we really need new uh, approaches or, or need to tackle this challenge uh, in the scaling thrust uh, direction. So finally, we've heard in the morning about magnetometry. There are challenges, uh, for example, for atom-based sensors or, or nitrogen vacancy centers. And sensing is a manifold and has a plethora of different sensor types and applications. Now, some developments are in the few sensor types uh, and research is really trying to improve the individual sensors in terms of sensitivity. Here, a great example, I guess, that we're going to hear about uh, later today is uh, the nano sensing and the imaging with envy sensors, which are embedded on an AFM tip. And with the first demonstrations about 10 years ago, this application was commercialized recently and allows now rasterizing across samples and extracting different information about the device under test. And this supports clearly the technology thrust innovation. Uh, for example, skirmions uh, for new uh, type of memories, magnetic nanostructures or ferromagnetic domains, uh, or uh, mentioned also in the morning, biomagnetic or electric signals. So there's other examples that require then many sensors. Uh, and this is magnetoencephalography, which also came up a few times this morning, uh, which are really at the brink of commercialization and where ideally hundreds of ultra-sensitive optically pumped atom magnetometers are placed on the head and then measure brain activity. And challenges here, among others, are really making these sensors comparable uh, and identical and then design a well-synchronized and crosstalk-free control electronics that control the, controls these sensor surveys. So with this, we end this keynote. And in summary, we've seen different examples on how to characterize quantum technologies within the scaling and the technology thrust. And in our opinion, this is useful as it helps to understand how to approach a certain problem and also understand and classify its boundary conditions. And most importantly for the old, current audience, maybe how mature a certain technology is. And with this, we look forward to you challenging us on this or uh, maybe just ask questions. Thank you.